Inflation, the hot topic of 2022. In this video, I'm going to go over my thesis of why I believe inflation has a peak, a lot of the factors that drove inflation, and how to predict it in the future, along with the impacts inflation has on the stock market. So the primary driver of inflation since the 70s is the price of oil. In this chart here, I have the price of oil as the black line and inflation as the orange line. Inflation is going to be naturally mean reverting because of how it works, but you can see that it moves in tandem with oil prices. When oil prices go up, inflation goes up, and when oil prices go down, inflation prices go down. And what we had is since the lockdowns in 2020, that brought the price of oil way down to that $20 a barrel level. And since then, it's been tearing up into the war to a peak of $130, $140. But since then, it's significantly come down in the 80s. And we're very unlikely to have persistent inflation like in the 70s, because you can see in oil was originally in that two to three dollars a barrel range and just over a 10 year period it went to over 40 dollars a barrel that's over a 10 times increase so unless we are getting a, a similar increase over this next decade we are unlikely to have that persistent inflation in the 1970s which was largely fueled by the 1970s energy crisis so why did inflation start tracking oil so closely in the 1970s? I believe this is largely because in 1971, the United States went off the gold standard before gold was pegged at $35 an ounce. And after this was dropped, gold ran up to almost six, $700 an ounce in the 70s. This is also when oil increased over 10 times its price as well. So there was effectively a mass devaluation of the US dollar. So it's not surprising that you would see a lot of inflation during this period. And after this, once the oil and gold prices both stabilized, inflation stabilized as well. So a unique driver of the inflation we're currently experiencing stems from the supply chain issues that were caused by the lockdowns in early 2020. And this was very evident on, for example, the cost of shipping. In the chart, I have the Baltic Dry Index, which is the index for shipping dry bulk goods. So you can see the index went to a low of around 500 when the lockdowns first occurred. And then by the end of 2021, was over 5,000. So in 2020, everyone originally stopped producing goods and stopped ordering goods because they thought the world was going to end <laughs> effectively. But when everyone realized everything was going to be fine and people were given stimulus checks and the mass demand for goods surged in again, then everyone's trying to order the same goods. There's a limited supply and there's a limited amount of containers to get those goods shipped over. So this drove up the cost quite a bit. I saw this personally myself as I own a business which does do imports and I do know other business owners that import as well. And before COVID, uh, the shipping costs may have been around $4,000 or so from a container from China. But at the height, containers were costing around $25,000. And near the end of 2020 and the beginning of 2021, I really saw the price for booking containers starting to jump, sometimes $500, $1,000 a week, as there was this mass run on containers. But since then, these supply chain issues have started to resolve. And you can see the Baltic Dry Index has come from 5,000 all the way to back under $1,000. So when the cost of shipping goes down, the cost of the imported goods is going to be going down as well. So this can either be passed on to the consumer in the form of lower prices, or you're at least not going to see prices rise as quickly in the future. And the sellers just may pocket this extra reduction in price and increasing their net margins as time goes on. These supply chain issues affected the supply and demand in everything, in all commodities across the economy. Another good example is in lumber. Well, this chart is only monthly closed, just like all the others. Lumber went from about a low of 250 in these random length lumber futures to actually to a peak of about 1800. And since then, you can see they've chopped around but have started to stabilize. And while 
it is higher than anything in the past. It is significantly lower than the peak. And even if the prices go back up again, it's still just going back to the prices we were previously seeing. So to see a lot more inflation and increased cost of goods, we would need the cost of lumber to go significantly higher than the peak of 1800. Another good example of the supply demand imbalances that the supply chain's issues caused is in the used car index. So you can see in this index here, it was 100 in 1995. And by about 2020, it had gone up to maybe only about 135, 140. And, but since the lockdowns and COVID, it went from 130, this 140 range to over 225. So it managed to go up more in just two years than it had in the previous 25. But now it's coming back down. And the interesting about, thing about this going forward, if these supply chain issues resolve themselves, there's a lot of different components of inflation, such as used cars, that may come down significantly, even if they're higher than they were before. If they do come down from their current level, so for example, if the used car index comes from right now 211 down to the 150s, during that period of it coming down, it'll have a significant deflationary effect on the inflation index. So one of the reasons the oil prices are unlikely, in my opinion, to continue increasing is it was largely a temporary reduction, again, caused by these lockdowns. And this created some of, again, this supply demand imbalance that oil production has been steadily getting back online, building its way up to those previous levels. And once the supply and demand balance again, prices should stabilize and we shouldn't see this rapid increase like we had before in the last two years. So now I'm going to break down inflation by looking at the sticky components and the flexible components. The flexible CPI or the flexible inflation are the certain components in inflation that are very sensitive to price movements. They may change a lot on a day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week or month-to-month -month basis, such as oil, for example, where the sticky CPI or sticky inflation is much slower to move. So you can see right now the sticky CPI is much lower than the 8-9% of the overall inflation numbers we're hearing. It's, it's actually only at about 5-6%. And when we put the flexible CPI on top, you can see this is the primary driver, which has really driven inflation, which is nice that it is coming back down now, but it actually spiked to 20%, which was much higher than it ever was even in the 70s. And this is what we're seeing with the cost of oil and even some of the other components such as used cars. And the interesting thing is, is that, for example, used cars and some of these other components of inflation that are more flexible, they may actually become deflationary. You can see in the past, there's been a lot of times when this flexible CPI has actually been negative. And in my opinion, we're very likely to start seeing that again. So even if the sticky CPI still maintains a little bit high around that five, 6% range, though it should slowly roll over and come back down, our overall inflation numbers could be much lower, at least for short periods of time, if the flexible CPI has a significant contraction. And what we're experiencing right now is much different than the 1970s. As you can see in the 1970s, the sticky and flexible CPI were moving very much in tandem together. This was inflation that was rooted in the economy in all areas, where right now, as I've gone over in the previous examples, this is largely due to these supply chain issues that we're seeing expressed in the flexible CPI and flexible inflation. We can also see that this core flexible CPI on a three-month rolling average, how dramatically the effect has been on it. When we look at a three-month rolling average, it went up to a high above 50%, and it's already started coming significantly down. So this just shows that when we do look at the shorter time frames, now the flexible CPI is significantly coming back down to that base level, and we may even start seeing it go negative in the future. So why does inflation matter? Why look at the correlation it has with the overall stock market? So in the chart here, I have inflation in the orange line and the S&P 500 in the black line. And I've marked every time there was a high peak of inflation with a green line. And you can see for the most part, every time there was a peak in inflation, it was typically a great time to buy 
for the most part. There was some periods of time, especially near the World War areas, but there was a lot more stuff going on back then where you've got a little bit more sideways, but very rarely was there any more significant downside. And especially in the 70s, when there was the really big waves of inflation and it topped off, almost obvious, if you had bought when there was the peak of inflation, you would have bought right near the market bottom. I hope you've enjoyed this information I've shared with you about inflation. Well, it's not necessarily predictive because, as I was saying, oil effectively moves in tandem with inflation. I believe that some of the evidence is pointing that we are going to see inflation start to contract quite significantly. This doesn't mean that in the future, after inflation has contracted for a while, it can't go back up. Things are always changing. But these are just some of the components I like to look at to see where inflation is possibly going in the future. And remember to like, share, and subscribe. And feel free to leave a comment in the comment section as well on your opinion on inflation or if you have any questions.